So welcome everybody to the Science Jam. Um, my name is Robert MacDonald. I'm co-chair for the uh, Y crew. So any young researchers that are interested in complexity, you could come up and chat to me afterwards. Uh, we're trying to build our network of young researchers, uh, which is partially why Ireland's here today. He has a PhD uh, open for algorithmic and mathematical biology, which I hope you might uh, briefly touch upon because there's a few uh, young researchers here today. Um, to briefly introduce Ayrton, he did his doctorate at DPhil in the University of Oxford. After that, he did a postdoc on dynamic and multi-scale systems. He's now an assistant professor at the Department of Mathematics and Information and Computing. Um, so he works on computational complexity and uses that to uncover algorithms in uh, social and biological systems. So I'll give the floor to Artem. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, I believe that sort of the mathematics of information are essential, not just for understanding technology, but also for making sense of the uh, natural world. And um, I think we can extend a lot of the mathematics of computer science to better talk about um, the natural and social sciences. Uh, that's kind of what I want to talk to you about. And also, as mentioned, uh, you're secretly in a big advertisement. Uh, I'm hiring a PhD candidate, and so I kind of wanted to introduce myself to a flavor of the kind of work I do in case there are people who are interested, or if you know um, any master students that might be interested, let them know uh, about the position. And uh, so, uh, what do I mean by games versus nature? Um, so, well, so mathematicians and computer scientists have gotten pretty good at uh, sort of playing very complex games against the most challenging opponents. But many of these games, from sort of chess to go, uh, have very simple and well specified rule sets. Now, unfortunately, the games that we play against nature don't always have such clear and well-known rules, but they still pit us against very uh, dynamic and adaptive opponents. So evolving populations are once a challenging opponent, especially in medicine. Um, so I study evolution from this game theory perspective uh, and work on making us better prepared to play against such a challenging opponent. Now, we usually think of evolution at the level of organisms, but evolution also happens within our bodies, and cancer is a consequence of this somatic evolution. And treating cancer requires us to adapt to this evolution dynamic um, uh, and how we might respond to various treatments. So just to give you a quick illustration of what I mean by this. So uh, suppose there's a hypothetical patient. Uh, she's feeling fine. They're her cells, they're all normal, represented here by um, large pink uh, circles. Uh, at some point, some cancer cells arise, represented here by small pink circles, right? At this stage, the cancer cells, uh, they're around, but they're not super widespread. The patient is not actually feeling any of the ill effects of the cancer. And so she's just going on about her life normally. At some point, the cancer gets larger and larger and spreads sufficiently that the uh, patient starts to feel, feel unwell. And at this point, uh, she goes to a doctor. Now, she goes to the doctor and the doctor, of course, uh, prescribes some sort of treatment. Um, and this treatment changes the environment in which the cells are now uh, living. So now I'm representing that as a change of color from this light green to this sort of darker green. Now, for most treatments, uh, initially patients respond to them very well. So uh, the light pink cancer cells here are ones that happen to be susceptible to the treatment. So they quickly start to disappear, but maybe the uh, darker red cancer cells are not as susceptible. They don't disappear. But either way, the tumor burden decreases significantly. The patient is um, on treatment, but feeling much better now. Now, uh, of course, a, 
uh, pertinent, doc pertinent doctor will continue to administer this treatment to make sure they can do the best they can for the patient. But unfortunately, in many cases, these very persistent cells that have survived treatment will take over the population. So they have high fitness in this environment still. And in most cases, this leads to uh, the patient's demise. Uh, and the relapse of oh, really, sorry, the tumor and the patient's demise. Now, if we look at this from our perspective of a biologist, we actually see the three hallmarks of um, evolution, right? So first we saw variation in traits among the population. So we had normal cells, we had therapy resistant cancer cells, we had uh, therapy resistant cancer cells, therapy cancer cells, therapy cancer cells. Then we had heritability of these traits. So usually cancer cells produce other cancer cells, help cells each other, healthy cells. Um, and we have differential survival in different environments, right? So different cells spread at different rates, and this depends also on the environment. So these three factors together give us enough to start thinking about evolutionary analysis of this problem. Now, this perspective on cancer is known as the somatic evolution of cancer. Uh, and it lets us think of cancer as an evolutionary disease within our bodies. Now, in addition to the clinical benefits of studying this, uh, there's also sort of some three reasons why I care about it for fundamental understanding of evolution itself, right? So cancer as a laboratory in which I understand evolution better. And the reason it makes good laboratory is because it operates on time scales that are fast enough to observe. Um, it has effects that are drastic enough to measure, and it comes with many methods for uh, intervening in the environment. And also, given the complex biology of human cells, there's also plenty of opportunity for new mathematics. So, <clears throat> this brief overview, any questions at this stage? Feel free to ask me at any point, raise your hand, or just shout me down. Um, so, as a computer scientist, um, I view this game um, as a game between a population and an environment. Um, so, I associate a fitness value, which I write down in this big array, with each type in the population experiencing each kind of environmental condition. And we associate a fitness to each one. The array of these fitnesses is then the population environment game payoff matrix. The distribution of uh, types in the population is then the mixed strategy for the population player. And the distribution of micro environments experienced by the population is the mixed strategy for the environment player. The population player's algorithm for updating a strategy is the evolutionary dynamic. And then the population environment game together with the environment strategy for updating its population, uh, updating its uh, strategy is the specify the natural world that we're, that we're living in. Um, and um, I'm especially interested in cases where the environment is under control of the population itself, right? Uh, this happens in cases where much of what you interact with is other living beings, for example. Um, and this setting uh, recovers sort of what you might have heard of as evolutionary game theory. Um, but then the other one that I'm very interested in is cases where the environment is under some outside control. So in this case, the uh, the, the, the physician. Um, and that perspective allows me to think of cancer treatment as a game against the tumor. Now, if we were playing chess or go, it'd be nice to know the rules before we started playing. Uh, similar thing happens with cancer. Um, in particular, this means that we want to know this population environment game, uh, specifically the entries of that matrix. Now, as mathematicians, we're often inclined to make up these rules, um, maybe based on some intuitions we have or some microscopic assumptions. Um, and this is sort of the standard way uh, a lot of mathematical oncology has been done. Um, but that's not the only thing we could do. We could also take a play out of the Economist playbook, which is this idea of revealed preferences. So an economist 
um, might not know how you value certain things. And so they might put you in settings where you have the opportunity to buy or not buy a certain thing or to trade certain things for certain other things. And they just see how you do those activities and based on that infer what your utility associated with each, uh, with each action is. And economists know that these will often not correspond to our stated preferences sometimes, right? Um, in the same way that sometimes our assumptions about microdynamics of cells don't correspond to the actual things that happen. Um, and we can recreate this by turning to our friends in the cancer biology department. Um, we can ask cells what they like, their revealed preferences through a series of experiments by seeing how they behave under a variety of conditions. So that's exactly one of the things I did with my colleagues. Um, so one of our major contributions to uh, oncology has been the building of what we call a game assay, which is sort of an experimental technique, a kernel mathematical technique for directly measuring the uh, ecology of cancer cells, the games that the cancer cells are playing against each other. Um, and the trick here is, uh, well, you know, there's the joke that, you know, you're not a mathematician if you're not lazy. Um, so, I call myself a mathematician, so that means I want to make my cancer biologist friends do as much of the work as possible. In particular, this means that if you design a new kind of experiment that the cancer biologist might not have otherwise done, but that they can easily do, you can make your math inference much, much more straightforward. Instead of taking whatever it is what they've been doing and trying to infer something from there, right? And so that's what we did. Um, and I'll just guide you really briefly through how the game assay works. So uh, first we need you know, two types of cells to measure. Uh, in this particular experiment, uh, we took some cancer cells from a patient, uh, lung cancer cells, uh, and then we cultured them for a while. Uh, we evolved one of them to have resistance to a drug called electinib, uh, and the other one was sort of in this naive parental state um, that didn't have its resistance. And then what you do is you ask your uh, biologist friend to um, mix these in co-culture, right? So they take a set of petri dishes. Uh, in this case, I drew five of them. In reality, there's a little bit more, um, where you put various mixtures of parental and resistant cells in your solution. This is a very straightforward experiment to do. It's, you take beakers, you mix them to a certain extent, you put that into the into the petri dish. Um, then for any given initial proportion, uh, we want that grow, uh, in our case, relatively short term, over five days. Uh, we take images every four hours. Uh, based on those images, we can infer the growth rates of the two populations. And those are then the fitnesses of those populations that we plot here on the uh, y-axis. And you repeat this for all the different mixtures. And now you have a whole bunch of fitnesses distributed over um, various different distributions of the two cell types. Then the mathematician comes in and says, ah, I can fit a line to that. Um, fits a line to that and calls that the fitness function. Mm -hmm. So this is how we measure the fitness function of, um, yeah. How do you, if I, do you define fitness here? Uh, here it is growth rate. Growth rate, yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, and there's like a, a- Relative growth rate or absolute growth rate? Uh, it's absolute growth rate, uh, but yeah, I mean, we can talk more about exactly uh, what this means here. Um, so yeah, and that gets us our fitness functions, and then we can look at sort of where those fitness functions intersect the p equals zero and p equals one line, and based on that, we recover our game matrix, and if we want, we can plot that game matrix at some point in some uh, in some game space so we can visualize them. And that's what we did with, you know, four different conditions of uh, these two cancer cell types competing with drug or without drug and with supporting tissues and without supporting tissues. And if you're, you know, really into cancer, uh, you can go in and see these have some interesting consequences for how we understand cancer, but I just wanted to guide you through the method behind it, right? The idea of taking some technique from economists of real preferences, figuring out how to do it in biology, doing it, and then getting uh, some nice measurements that people haven't been able to do before. Um, 
And in particular, this approach opened, opened a whole door for us of new things to look at and how to move back and forth between modeling and measuring. Yeah. Well, maybe a little bit too daring question, but I, I would just say, because I mean, we are in theoretical biology and I think what you have been explaining so far, I would, I would do it more or less exactly like you do, but I wouldn't use the word game. So now the, um, so what you call a game essay, game metrics, I see their ordinary differential equations. I see the coefficients of growth rate uh, in your, so where, why, why do we need the word game here? But um, are we using the game theory behind this or? Yeah, we will in the people slides. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, part of it is just to connect to the existing evolutionary game theory literature. Mm -hmm. If you look at that literature yeah. and you ask where those games come from, they come from our head. Mm -hmm. um, now we can measure them directly. So at least we can compare what we have in our head versus what we have in actual measurements. In the case of mathematical oncology, the kind of games we've measured are not ones that have been studied before in the literature. So that already, you know, if you care about evolutionary game theory, it already tells you, oh, we're, we're thinking about some of the wrong kind of games. So there's like these mm -hmm. very like concrete yeah. things. Uh, but there's some future work where it becomes even more uh, important. So what are these next steps? Uh, thank you for asking. <laughs> um, so one of these is uh, to think about um, the effects of spatial structure. Now this method, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky what we exactly mean by fitness, um, because we were making a distinction between two levels, <clears throat> an effective level of dynamics that we observe at the macroscopic level and the reductive level, which is what might be happening uh, at, you know, how cells interact at the individual level. And so for a biologist, the um, contrast might be population growth rate versus cell doubling time or the inverse of cell doubling time, right? In very simple models, it's very straightforward to translate between those two, yeah. but we seldom work in very simple models, right? Uh, for people who are coming more from a physics background, the analogy would be something like temperature versus the motion of atoms, right? Temperature is some macroscopic property that we have some operationalized way of measuring by taking a thermometer and sticking it in, uh, while the microscopic properties of molecules moving implement that. But depending on the model, that implementation might be very simple. In the ideal gas, it's just the average kinetic energy of the atoms, but it, it could be something very complicated. In the lattice, the average movement of, this, of, the, of the particles doesn't correspond in any straightforward way to the actual temperature of that lattice. Um, and you get the same thing in evolutionary game theory with spatial structure. Sometimes it's simple, you know, if you have a well-mixed environment, uh, an invested environment, then your reductive game is exactly the same as your effective game. But we know in most cases, spatial structure drastically changes the kind of game that, that happens. Um, and the way people usually study this is they then start with some assumptions about the reductive game. They add some spatial structure. In some ideal cases, they find a mathematical transformation that takes them from the reductive game to a new effective population level, if you're observing just the population level. Um, in other cases, we just do simulations to, to, to get this implicitly with a snap. Um, but what's happening in this system? It's hard to say, right? It's a complicated spatial structure. It's not a random K regular graph, let's say. It's not well mixed. What is it? Well, we could try to make assumptions, or we could think about uh, measuring techniques that invert this arrow, right? And try to start with a measurement of the effective game, some measurement of some features of the population structure, and then push down through that towards a slightly more reductive game. Right? And exactly what aspects of space or what aspects of population structure you care about will depend on your application. So one of the things that you know, a potential PhD candidate could do with me <laughs> is to think about uh, how do we do this um, <coughs> computation that you've done forwards, but now backwards. And you know, let's take some you know, cells, uh, cancer image cells and try to calculate these things in, in practice. <coughs> um, Another uh, sort of thing, and this is where the game theory comes in a little bit more, um, that I really care about is um, how much information and control do physicians need to do well against the tumor. Now, if you're a computer scientist, 
and you quickly saw the equations they were flashing by for replicative dynamics that uh, population follows, you'd yell out, ah, that's multiplicative weight updating. That's an optimal, uh, that's an optimal algorithm for playing zero, zero sum games, right? And so what does that tell you? That tells you that cancer is really good at this game, right? It's not, you know, people like to describe, oh, evolution is down under, it's just searching around blindly, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, where all the types are already present in the population and just competing between each other for, for representation of the population, um, the algorithm that evolution follows is in some strict sense optimal. And so as a physician, you're actually faced against an optimal player and you're playing against them a game for which you don't know the rules with only partial control of the environment. And so this is one of the things that I really want to know more about. Um, so in this particular case, we could say, okay, uh, well, cancer cell is you're just taking strategy. Uh, it's mixed strategy is the distribution of the two types in the population. Um, but each of the four different environmental conditions corresponds to sub matrices of our bigger population versus environment game matrix. And then in this case, the physician uh, can choose between the four different environmental settings, which just picks out the game issue, but only has part of control over them. So the physician can choose here, 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 but within that matrix, the population still chooses the exact distribution. Um, so the doctor has partial control. Uh, what can they do with that? In the case of this particular population environment game, nothing. Like, this is a bad game that the patient's not going to do well. Um, but in general, what can we do? Um, and more importantly, the game asset that I described to you earlier was very, very invasive. It could never be done in a patient because the first step it required was for me to mix different proportions of cells and put them in a petri dish, right? In the patient, that would be taking parts of your tumor, mixing them together, and then putting them back in the patient. That would be unacceptable. Um, so instead, you'd want to figure out the rules of the game, not from such very easy direct measurements, but by inferring based on how it responds to the strategies you play in that game, right? Now it's a reinforcement learning problem for the, uh, the doctor, and the doctor knows that they're playing a rational agent uh, because evolution is following an optimal dynamic in this case. So does that answer a little bit of why game theory might come in and become yeah, relevant? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Great. So that's another thing that I'd love for a PhD candidate to think about. Um, uh, any questions about, about this first cancer bit? We're going to move a little bit away from it for the second half of the talk. Yeah. So you said, okay, well, all of the potential um, cancer types are already present, but on the lifespan of this patient, how re realistic or justifiable is that assumption? That's a great question. That's exactly what the second part of the talk is about. So I'll get started on that then. Uh, it's not super uh, reasonable assumption a lot of times, but sometimes it's still a pretty good assumption. Uh, but the second part of the talk talks about the case where new types arise. So, um, and that's endless evolution. Uh, yeah, so we care not just about how existing types compete, but how new types arise and enter the population, right? Um, to use some slogans, we're gonna move from survival of the fittest to arrival of the fittest, using these words very loosely here. Um, so from an evolutionary perspective, the game assay and all the associated math I was talking about was looking um, at sort of the survival of the fittest. It's focused on the short-term evolution driven by selection among pre-existing genetic variation in the population, right? But long-term evolution, especially in microscopic systems, is driven much more by the arrival of new, new mutations, of new types coming in. So to better control the evolution in microscopic systems like tumors, we need to understand not just this survival of how different types compete, but also how do the different types arise in the population. So in cancer, this might be questions like, uh, you know, what kind of mutation causes the first cancer cell or what kind of mutation about therapy resistance. But more generally, in a more general evolutionary context, you could ask questions like, why is evolution endless? Why are there always new types that can arise? And why can those types often still 
you know, uh, make their way in the population. Now, um, this is obviously a, a, a question that biologists since, since Darwin and Wallace were thinking about, right? And, and we, always, we can look back, we can look at the last sentence of On the Origin of Species. It's a long sentence, I'm going to give you the, the final few words from it, and, you know. From so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. So clear to Darwin and Wallace, it's an ongoing process, I and mean, that's the point of the book, is to convince you that it's an ongoing process, not just reverting back to small deformations from Aristotelian types. Um, and so how did, uh, you know, given, given that even Darwin and Wallace knew that it's an endless process, how did they account for the endlessness of evolution? Um, so there's two sort of standard approaches that biologists give, and there's biologists in the audience who can mm -hmm. dispute with me and tell me there's more great approaches. Um, one of these approaches comes, of course, uh, both been taken by Darwin. Um, the first approach comes, of course, Darwin is, a, is, is, I guess, fundamentally a geologist. He's going around looking at how coral reefs form and unform, how different islands form and disform. So for him, the slow change of the environment is obvious. And that is one of the great explanations why evolution is endless, because there's always environmental change, right? So the population might be adapting, getting better and better for its environment, but before it gets perfect at its environment or very, very good at its environment, the environment changes, right? And that matters even more now when the environment is changing more and more rapidly, let's say. Um, and yeah, so there, by giving something new to adapt to, you can always generate new things for the population uh, to do. That's, that's one answer that both Darwin and Wallace had. The other answer they had is frequency-dependent selection. Um, in your environment, uh, a lot of it is determined by other organisms that are also evolving, right? And so you can get into arms races of you get an ad adaptation or your population gets an adaptation that responds well to, let's say, a predator population. But then that predator population gets a new adaptation that counters your first one, and then you get a new one, a new one, so you can imagine... I don't know, turtles getting thicker and thicker armor, and I don't know what it's turtles. Whatever tries to eat turtles gets sharper and sharper teeth or stronger and stronger jaws, um, et cetera. So you can get these arms races that will easily cycle you. Or you can get even simpler things like a rock, paper, scissors game, where, you know, rock beats paper. No, sorry. Paper beats rock, rock beats scissors, and you go in that endless cycle. So if you have those three types, they'll kind of just always be endlessly in motion. Great, but this doesn't quite capture everything. You know, what about static worlds? Um, and in particular, what if we go further back in that last sentence? If we go to the start of Darwin's last sentence, it goes, he starts with, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, so he's saying from simplicity, we get this constant emerging and evolving complexity. So already Darwin can see a tension here between this simplicity and this complexity. These ones were sort of hoping that the simple environment would keep changing and thus it could kind of harvesting complexity from the environment. Uh, here it's, okay, this is a little bit different. Um, of course, we could say, oh, well, static worlds don't matter, or, you know, or these two cases happen almost always, and maybe that's true. Um, but it's certainly not 100% true, right? Uh, we can go to Richard Lenski. So about... A year before I was born, Richard Lunsky decided to take 12 different strains of E. coli and put them in 12 different petri dishes, let them grow for a day. At the end of the day, he came, he harvested them, uh, diluted them slightly, put them in new petri dishes, and he's been doing that for 35 or 36 years now. I guess he's recently passed the torch on this experiment. Um, so in the same static environment, as much as he could keep the environment static, He's been growing E. coli for uh, over three decades now. Um, over, I think, like 100,000 generations now or something like that. Um, and when he was writing this grant in the late 80s, he would have expected it to run for a few years. Things to equilibrate to a new high fitness plateau for the for E. coli. And once it got adapted to this strange new environment of a petri dish, given that they usually come from not the petri dish. But that's not what happened. Um, you look over, in this case, this is a paper from back in 2013. So we're looking over just the first 50,000 generations. Um, there's continued fitness gain in the population. 
right? Um, and here they try to argue that it's unbounded. Um, so even in a static world where we specifically try to eliminate both environmental change okay. and at least any long-term frequency dependent selection, um, we still get this endless evolution. So what gives? Now, to study this, <clears throat> we need to have some model of how uh, genotypes change over time, how new things come and go into the population. Uh, and for that, we can introduce the idea of a fitness landscape. Um, the idea is that we take our genotypes, which we use, uh, each associated with a static fixed fitness, and then we add some notion of locality, saying this genotype <laughs> connects to this genotype. That's a potential mutation could take us from here to there. That gives us a space. Um, and we can think about uh, um, evolution as taking us upwards in that space, right? Now, based on cartoons like this, on these low dimensional cartoons of fitness landscapes, People tended to assume, oh, well, you'll just climb until you reach a local peak, and then you'll get stuck there. Uh, and this is what I would call easy fitness landscape. And that's how people tended to imagine fitness landscapes. <clears throat> so one of my contributions to evolutionary biology has been showing that there also exist hard classes of hard fitness landscapes. Um, these are landscapes where no evolutionary dynamic can find any local peak in polynomial time. Uh, polynomial time is polynomial in the size of the genome, right? So for this cases of you know, life on Earth, it's the genome, let's say, is 30,000 genes, to the 30,000 is an unimaginably large number. So, so basically, uh, never, if you can't find polynomial time. Um, and this gives us, these hard fitness landscapes come from consideration of computational complexity, of the problem encoded by the landscape, and in particular from the complexity class called PLS, polynomial local search. And it gives us that sort of computational complexity can allow for endless evolution. And this is sort of something that should be familiar to computer scientists. All computer scientists know that you can state a simple problem to which the answer nobody will be able to find. It has an answer, but it'll be so complicated, it'll take so long to find it, right? This encodes this kind of idea, but in the case of a local search strategy. Um, so on these hard landscapes, no matter how clever new mutants arrive, right? You know, if they arrive at random, they're not going to find it. If they arrive through some clever, you know, they sit down and they sort of solve a linear program before deciding which, which gene mutates, no matter how clever they are, they won't be able to find um, a local fitness peak, and instead they'll always be slowly winding up and there'll always be adaptive mutations nearby available for them to improve the population's fitness. So if we go back to the broader framing of evolutionary games, in other words, there exist games where sort of um, even very sophisticated players can't arrive at a sort of final set of ideal strategies. They'll always find slightly better strategies to play. Uh, so that kind of answers the cancer question, but not really, because that was more practical. Um, and so, of course, real fitness landscapes, the whole point is that they don't look like those cartoons I drew, right? Um, rather, they're a very complicated material object. Here's a relatively simple fitness landscape on uh, six bits. Um, and uh, what makes these fitness landscapes easier or hard at the coarsest level is nonlinear interactions between genes, what biologists like to call uh, epistasis. Um, and at the broadest level, if your fitness landscape only has magnitude epistasis in it, then it's guaranteed to be easy. Um, on the other hand, once you start to introduce sine epistasis or circle sine epistasis, um, there's a possibility for your fitness landscape uh, to, be, to become hard. Um, and to give my intuition of what something like uh, sine epistasis means, uh, if you look at this little picture here, Zero, zero, uh, the zeros versus ones are some gene being in value zero or value one. And the first gene here is on the left, the second gene is on the right. And we can see that in the background of the second gene being zero, the first gene prefers to be one. One is the higher fitness. On the other hand, in the background of the second gene being one, the first gene 
prefers to be zero to so you have that sign flip, and that's why it's called sign epistasis. And if you have it happening both ways, then it's reciprocal sign epistasis. Um, and so at the very broad level, if you only have this, it would be easy. If you have these, you can start to express hard fitness landscapes, and it's not that difficult to express them. But what I start, what I really care about now is, you know, that's a very broad statement. Right? Just one of these won't make the fitness landscape hard. How much do you need? Um, and so to capture that, uh, I want to study this sort of fine-grained structure of uh, epistasis. And so now what I do is I create a gene interaction network. So the way this works is the nodes of our gene interaction networks are going to be loci, and we're going to add an edge between two loci if they're somewhere in the fitness landscape where they have sign or reciprocal sign epistasis. And if everywhere in the fitness landscape they only have magnitude epistasis, we won't um, add an edge between them. So uh, intuitively encode sort of where in your in your genome are there nonlinear interactions happening, um, and uh, the way to link this back to our view of population versus environment games is now the environment is fixed. We're in a static world, so there's only one uh, column. But the number of rows, the number of different types of genotypes is exponentially large, right? And I can't write down just an exponential list of numbers. It's too big. Instead, you write down something like this graph, which is relatively compact. It's polynomial in the number of loci, and that encodes the information about the whole exponentially many different genotypes. Can I ask? Yeah. So, so um, if you take two nodes, you conclude that there is that if in any background of the other nodes, there is an exactly thing. Yeah, yeah. So even if it's only one out of the two to the n states yeah. where, okay. Yeah, yeah. At least for the for the for the rough definition, okay. um, we'll get more refined a bit later. Sure. Um, and yeah, so so then we can write down these graphs, and we can ask what properties must these graphs have to uh, produce easy versus hard fitness landscapes. Um, and so we know one of the ones that produce easy landscape. I told you if there is no sign or some step stasis, then there'll be an easy landscape. So you know if it's just uh, a graph of n nodes that aren't connected to each other, then that'll be easy. Uh, but can we do something better? Um, and this is where we bring in um, questions of crown trace complexity that so many computer scientists are um, excited about. And we ask what parameters of this graph, uh, which I call as a biologist, gene interaction network, as a computer science, I would call it a value constraint satisfaction problem, or a VCSP. Um, so what uh, what properties of this graph produce each which are landscape? And so one of the things that we proved uh, with uh, Dave Cohn and Pete Jevons is that uh, if you have a biallelic system where gene interactions are only binary, I know big asks, but go with me for now, uh, and they form a tree structure, the gene interaction network, then that will always be an easy fitness landscape. In particular, the longest adaptive path you could have in that fitness landscape will be a length n plus one choose two, where n is the number of loci. Um, and it's a bit of a complicated proof. I'm not going to go into any details of it, but it's also surprisingly tight. If you relax any of the words I said, you can start to encode some hard fitness landscapes, right? So if you relax biallelic and allow triallelic, three alleles that are given genotype, um, then you can start to encode fitness, hard fitness landscapes even with trees or even with paths on a constraint graph. Uh, if you restrict, if you relax um, interactions from being uh, only pairwise epistasis possible, but three area epistasis is now possible, you can also start to hide some hard fitness landscapes. Um, or if you relax it from being a tree to having a uh, tree with two, which is, you know, uh, a parameter that computer scientists care about that tells you how tree-like a given graph is, and there you start to be able to hide hard fitness landscapes already. Um, now, some of these fitness landscapes aren't hard for many dynamics, only hard for some particular dynamics. So, uh, you know, this particular construction here, which I won't go into detail about, is hard for a dynamic, which is very silly. It says, I'm going to go uphill, but I will always go uphill by the least increment, right? So you'd say, oh, that's, that's not a very likely one. 
But you might say something like, oh, I'll go, always go uphill, but I'll go uphill by the biggest increment, right? That's called steepest ascent. That's a pretty popular uh, heuristic used in, um, in computer science, at least. Um, and if you look something in biology like strong selection weak mutation and certain limits, you'll also get that kind of dynamic out as the evolutionary dynamic. Um, well, you don't have to relax this too much, right? You can you have construction that are tree with seven, and actually my master's student and I recently reduced that to tree with four, um, where <laughs> you have fitness landscapes that are hard for steepest ascent, um, and the gene track network is relatively simple. It's kind of like a tree. Um, and the point of this is to sort of separate these two classes of <clears throat> fitness landscapes where it's easy for evolution to find a stable set of strategies. And then we can switch to the logic of the first half of the talk, where we just look at the existing types in the population and see what's happening and how to play against that, versus ones where it's not possible for evolution to find a stable set of strategies, and thus we probably shouldn't do the, the first part of the talk on it. So what are some next steps here? Um, one of the next steps I really care about, this is just a very computer science question to some extent. Um, we can make a complexity hierarchy of, of how much different structure uh, does the fitness landscape need to have for it to become easier or hard for various dynamics, right? And so uh, in this very confusing figure, um, on the left, you have different notions of what it might mean for a landscape to be hard with respect to what. So something like this means hard with respect to any polynomial time algorithm, the strongest version of hard that I gave you, while something like this might be the weakest notion of hard, which is like there exists some long adaptive path, right? Maybe it's a very silly one, but it, but it exists. And as we move from bottom to top on the left-hand side, we talk about different notions of you know, more and more permissive classes of algorithms um, and the things that's going to be easier or hard for them. And then on the right-hand side, we talk about various uh, properties of the fitness graph or the fitness landscape. Um, and what do we know about, about uh, their tractability or intractability according to these various algorithms? So uh, there's a lot of gaps in here. Um, and there's a lot of surprising gaps in here. Uh, so if you're a computer science student that's excited about uh, parameterized complexity. There's a lot of really fun parameterized complexity of local search here, um, which we know very little about uh, and I want to know much more about. Of course, there's also the empirical question. Um, so suppose we have that uh, complexity hierarchy or a partial complexity hierarchy. That's not very useful to us if we don't know what actual uh, fitness landscapes look like. Right. Um, and so here we can talk about how would we infer gene interaction networks from local measurements of fitness landscapes. Right. We can't sit down and look at every single possible combination of genotypes. Right. Like you said, uh, you know, is that one combination that creates uh, magnitude of uh, sign of You know, you can imagine that being hard to find. So it makes some assumptions about, let's say, the amount of the overall amount of epistasis, uh, epistasis or about the uh, area of the epistasis, i.e. how many genes can interact together nonlinearly at, at a given time uh, in a way that's not decomposable into their sub-interactions. Uh, if we make some assumptions about that, then we can start to infer the exact gene interaction networks from the sort of local fitness measurements that we are able to do, i.e. taking a wild type, generating all point mutants, all double mutants, okay, Triple mutants, okay, we're getting carried away a little bit, but that's still a polynomial number of samples for a given, uh, uh, for a given wild type. Based on that, we can infer what that gene traction network looks like. There's some robust techniques to account for both the noise of measurement and uh, to eliminate non-important interactions, interactions that, that seem to create an edge but don't actually lead to any synapses anywhere. Uh, and based on that, we can start to see, oh, where does it fit into this graph? Are the fitness landscapes we're measuring in practice, are a lot of them coming out to be very easy or a lot of them coming out to be very hard, right? Um, and third thing that I'd like to be able to do, again, pitching projects for, for potential uh, PhD candidates, 
um, is that first whole second half of the talk, we had a single column in our um, uh, population versus environment game. That's very simple, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe if we're a little bit more generous, we could say we had several columns, but we had a fixed distribution over the columns, right? Uh, so that's still a very, very uh, limited case. It'd be nice to bring back some of these frequency dependent selection, right? Unfortunately, that makes things much more difficult to analyze, right? Your simple fitness landscape becomes this complicated game landscape. But from some preliminary results, it seems like this introduction of ecology into your illusory dynamics actually changes the kind of computations that your evolutionary dynamics are capable of, right? Uh, in particular, if you make a sufficiently abstract model of evolution without frequency dependent selection, it becomes equivalent to something called SQ learning. Um, but an SQ learning isn't capable of learning something like the hidden parity function. But if you add a little bit of ecological interaction, i.e., the, the littlest amount you can add, right? Which is you allow sometimes two types to coexist and compete with each other, right? Never three types, never four types. This is the, the littlest amount you could add. Um, and they only go to the one from fixation, and the new mutant arises only after somebody comes to fixation. So it's the small amount you could have added. The kind of brings you to the that even happens in Lenski's experiment, where occasionally he'll have a new type arise that has some previously different interaction with the, with the, with the, with the wild type. Um, and in that setting, you get uh, evolutionary dynamic, which is now capable of learning the uh, or adapting to the hidden parity function, right? So it becomes strictly more powerful computationally. Um, and I'd like to understand much more of this, right? What, is, what does this mean beyond, you know, something like hidden parity function? Okay, there's reasons why you should care about this as a computer scientist, but as a biologist, you don't. It's a very artificial, it's a very artificial function. Um, what is it? about ecology that's giving you a different kind of computational power. On the flip side of this, um, how does development fit into all of this? Um, in some sense, development introduces structure into your fitness landscape because it isn't now arbitrary sequence of genes comes to some number, right? It's arbitrary sequence of genes leads to some processes and these processes have rule-based interactions with each other and those rule-based interactions can allow for certain kinds of uh, adaptive feedback between the components that make up the whole of the organism. And that can change very much how you navigate um, a, a fitness landscape, right? If you imagine things are very, you know, non-interactive, um, uh, you know, suppose you're looking at, at, a, at a human that only has body and heart development, um, and you imagine that there was no interaction between how the body develops and how the heart develops, right? And so, or how the, let's make that heart, let's make the vascular system develops. And you can imagine I got a mutation that made my arm slightly longer, but there's no feedback between the length of my bones and the blood system. And so now just that part of my arm no longer gets vasculature, right? That would be very silly. And that's not what happens, right? If instead I got a mutation that made my arm slightly longer, the vascular system adjust automatically to it without any new mutations. It knows to build extra vasculature to account for the extra growth of my arm. Um, these feedbacks can sometimes simplify your, uh, the evolutionary search that's happening because they can sort of deform the phenotypic effect of your mutations. So even if your mutations are uniformly random, which again is debatable, the phenotypic effect of those mutations very much not uniformly random, right? And because these processes themselves arose through adaptation, there can often be correlations between the way in which it deviates from uniformity and the shape of the fitness landscape. So this is something I care a lot about. Um, now, I don't know how to get data for this from biology. Um, maybe I should start doing fruit fly experiments, but uh, I know how to get this data from doing meta science. So um, if we look at something like uh, complex algorithms that computer scientists make up, so like deep learning algorithms that you've probably heard about, uh, we have an evolutionary record of how those have changed over time. If we look at the last 20 years of proceedings of neuro ips, let's say, uh, we have papers every year 
with those papers, we have some amount of code. And from that code, we can make this same kind of developmental structure between the sort of ideas that they're referencing versus the final implementation of the classifier that their that their um, that their paper produces. Um, and the hope is to be able to learn about these uh, sort of interactions between evolution and development, but here now it's the cultural evolution of um, deep learning algorithms. So if there is any master's students that are really excited about this and want to do that as part of their PhD, here's another fun topic that I would uh, love some help on. And so do you want to join me on any of this? <laughs> Please do. Um, there's a QR code. I think it'll take you to the application page. It's also down here if you want. Uh, that's hard to type. Uh, you can also email me, uh, a a.kazanship at uu.nl. And with that, I have time for questions. It's one of three positions. <laughs> it's one position, um, unfortunately. <laughs> so, so probably can't do all the things, but um, I guess there's not many people that are interested in all the things. So, if any of those appeal to you or something similar to those, then then please please get in touch. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. It's just really interesting. Um, I was wondering about your um, optimization, especially in the, in the second part and finding the, the optimal strategies. Um, if I understand correctly, you now mostly use kind of local searches. And is it possible that in this biological example, sometimes the system takes larger jumps through the space? And, and might that affect your um, your algorithms, basically? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so how local or non-local? The, so there's two notions of local here, right? There's local, the local that defines the fitness landscape itself, the structural properties of it. Um, and so it defines what a local peak is, for example. And then there's the potential local restraints you put on what the algorithm can do, right? And what you're saying is, oh, well, biology doesn't necessarily have this. Let's say uh, a sexual population just mixes a whole bunch of genes together and it's like a big jump, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I do need the local on the structure. I don't need the local on the algorithm. And so depending on how local or non-local you want to be on that algorithm is how high or low you are on the left-hand side of this classification. Um, now, recently I've focused a lot on very local algorithms just because they become very fun combinatorial puzzles um, that people didn't know the answers to and were trying to learn some answers to. Uh, but I am very interested in, in, in sort of non-local effects there or non-local algorithms for local search problems. Yeah. Maybe just a follow up. So, so, if your algorithms are not local, what then does the locality structure still mean? Right. So, I would I would argue that if you're looking on the landscape, then the locality is only defined by where you can go in what step or information you can take into account if you're in a certain position. So, can you explain that? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's just a like so. What you end up having is these inclusions where uh, we often focus on the structure the most the most restrictive version of local mm -hmm. because any more permissive version of local on the uh, on the problem side makes the problem only more difficult because if you if you have a restrictive definition of local like point mutations let's say mm -hmm. right uh, we would say well, any version of local should have point mutations as one of the possibilities, you might have more, right? If we look at that most restrictive version of local, then any more permissive one will only eliminate local peaks, right? Mm -hmm. If you have local meaning also double mutations and triple mutations and recombinations, okay, that increases the neighborhood of each point mm -hmm. and might eliminate some local peaks but won't introduce any new ones. And if we prove that even in this restrictive version, finding a local peak is intractable, then it will also be intractable in the more permissive version. Mm -hmm. That's why we separate the two. And on the other side, on the algorithm side, the opposite tends to happen, but not always. 
the more permissive we get with what local means there, the easier it becomes for search. And that's why we try to separate the two. We try to be as restrictive as possible here and as permissive as we can on the algorithm side. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm still processing. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So I, I really liked a lot the, the title of, I guess, a, a new paper that you are writing. Nothing makes sense in deep learning, the uh, life of revolution. How, how do you study that? Because for us uh, outsiders, deep learning remains to be a bit of a black box uh, that is very difficult to uh, analyze because it has so many uh, <laughs> parameters like the the uh, biological evolution, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's what makes it a fun problem, right? Because mm -hmm. it is complicated, but it has a very rich fossil record. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that particular paper with Conrad is more of an opinion piece type mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Basically, um, you know the book, The Plausibility of Life? Yeah. Uh, I didn't read, I heard about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed the book. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking, okay, let's just hit something with this book. Mm -hmm. And so then I saw deep learning and I hit deep learning with that book. Mm -hmm. And out came that paper where we think about um, in the same way that you might think about how body plans influenced, uh, you know, evolution trajectories. How did various mm -hmm. early innovations mm -hmm. in, by, in deep learning that allow algorithms to adapt to each other without the interaction of the programmer, mm -hmm. speed up and lock in in evolutionary settings, right? So something like autograph, for example, before a certain amount of time in deep learning, you had to always sit down and differentiate your functions yourself, figure out that you did those correctly, and then feed those into, into your backpropagation algorithm. Nobody does that anymore. Um, everyone uses autograph, which is as long as you specify your forward function in a reasonable language, the computer automatically figures out what the derivatives are. And so now it becomes much easier to mutate that than it was before. Mm -hmm. And it becomes much easier to mutate that in a viable way, right? Before you might have come up with a cool new uh, forward function, but you made a mistake differentiating it or you didn't know how to. Um, and then your final class card becomes unviable, right? It just completely breaks down. Now you come up with a clever new update function in the same way that the blood structure adjusted to the new bone. Um, the architecture just to that update rule. And so so at this at this first paper, we're doing like this sort of natural uh, naturalist approach to it, mm -hmm. right? Where we take some particular notable examples from the history of deep learning and, mm -hmm. and see how they fit into this perspective. Um, right now I'm working with Conrad and a, some one of his PhD students and on doing this a little bit more mechanistically, um, where we actually have all the papers from NeuroWebs for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're trying to restructure how ideas and how code moves between those papers, but it's very preliminary right now. Mm -hmm. um, but the data is there, it's just a matter of making sense of it. Very right, interesting. Yes. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm a geographer, so I was interested by your, your um, ideas about spatial structure. And I have first a question for understanding. So were you talking about the spatial structure in the Petri dish or not? Uh, yeah, yeah, in that particular image. Yeah. Um, and so in the experiments, when you were mixing different um, proportions of the two cells, did you make different spatial structures there? Uh, not on purpose, um, but by accident. Okay. Uh, because the way this kind of experiment, sorry, I just want to find a picture of it and I put too many buttons at once. Okay. Um, so the way that these burns work is that you have some, some, some food on the slide and you just kind of smear, well, distribute the cells over it. And they adhere kind of randomly-ish to the food and then they start growing after a certain food up time. Yeah. And so because of there is some space structure that's created by that adherence process. Mm -hmm. And of course that space structure is reset every time you replate, let's say. Yeah. Um, but that is still enough space structure to like move game theory behave differently. Mm -hmm. We haven't gone in depth into that, but that space structure we can just uh, recover perfectly from the actual images. We just haven't um, uh, because we don't know what to do with it yet. Um, uh, so if you would want to filter out that effect, you would need several petri dishes with the same amount of uh, or 
distribution between the two groups of cells and different special structures? Or? Yeah, that might not be enough because there's, it's really easy to change the behavior of games. Mm -hmm. Something even just like taking local subsamples, even though they're all uh, representative in some sense, the act of taking a local subsample already changes the game slightly. Um, so even that is enough, right? The only way you could really do it is if it was really, in fact, even the well-mixed population that people describe, as people have calculated, and it's actually even when you stir, it's not exactly the same mm -hmm. thing, right? Um, so the, the, the issue is to figure out, yeah, what can we, can we learn from this? Um, and the only way I see forward right now is to mess with the spatial structure by, for example, instead of taking a normal Petri dish, um, you print a certain pattern on it, oh, yeah. let's say, right? Or you have some film that separates your two types, let's say, and now only um, small molecules of the can go between them, but not the cells directly, right? So it's probably going to be through these sort of very rough level uh, manipulations of the space structure that we'll be able to learn these things. Okay, yeah, thanks. I think that would be interesting. And also regarding your, your last point, that if you can find things that don't evolve, maybe you will find them in evolution of space. So maybe you can find examples there. Yeah. Just the same what you said about bodies. If, if cities evolve, you also need um, utility networks to grow with it automatically in a way. Right? So, yeah, yeah, we could find data for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm really interested in looking for data that's of systems that behave biologically ish or mm -hmm. cultural evolutionary ish at least, mm -hmm. but are not, well, where we have just a richer yeah, archaeological record. So, yeah, cities would be fun. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't know much about them. Yes. Super. I think we can oh, leave it based on time uh, because otherwise, don't think you believe it. Thank you very much, Ariel. Okay. Uh, for those that might be applying for a PhD, uh, if you're interested in joining the young researchers, uh, Malexi researchers with Utrecht, come approach us. Uh, also, if you have any PhD candidates that uh, you're supervising that are doing anything related to complexity, and um, we're basically young researchers kind of bouncing ideas off one another, working on proposals uh, from a variety of fields. So we're trying to grow the network of uh, young researchers using complexity. Thanks, Ariel. Thank you.